1728, a group of 40 investors, mostly farmers from eastern Massachusetts, purchased 7,500 acres of land from the Nipmucks for 2,500 pounds sterling. The Massachusetts court had the land assessed and approved the transaction. The governor named the new town Grafton, after the Duke of Grafton, a relative of the English king. In 1729, when the land purchase was approved, the court set a series of requirements. These included the building of both a meeting house and a school, and the hiring of a minister and a teacher. The meeting house was built on what is now Grafton Common, and the school was built nearby. In 1731, the Reverend Solomon Prentice was hired and was ordained as the first pastor of the Congregational Church of Grafton. The Reverend Solomon Prentice was 27 when he married Sarah Sartell. She was only 16. She was from a wealthy Groton family and was very well educated. She knew the Bible so well that she could recite any part of it. Her father was opposed to her marriage to this poor country preacher, but Sarah was a headstrong young woman and could not be dissuaded. She was also a woman of independent thought. Once, when her husband was traveling to preach at another church, Sarah became infatuated with the teachings of another itinerant preacher and she allowed herself to be baptized in the river, a ritual that was not approved of by her husband. When Solomon returned and learned what had happened, there was an argument. He flew into a rage and shouted, Ah, it's water, is it, that you want? Well, you shall have it. And he threw a bucket of water over her. In spite of such differences, they had ten children together. Three died in childhood, and their eldest son, Solomon, was killed while blasting a well on Brigham Hill. He was only 14. The family graves can be found at the Oak Street Cemetery. The meeting house where Solomon Prentice preached served as both the church and the assembly hall for town meetings. It remained on the common for 100 years until 1835. The Puritans had allowed only their brand of Christianity and had persecuted all others. But by the late 1700s, their power had diminished and many different religious groups were becoming popular. The 1830s was a time of religious unrest in Grafton. At that time, a great rift occurred within the Grafton Congregational Church. Half the congregation split off to become the Unitarian Parish. Each group built a church on the common. The Congregationalists built theirs on the west side of the common at the top of Church Street and the Unitarians built theirs at the near end of North Street. The old meeting house was moved to the area adjacent to the new Congregational Church where it served as a commercial building until it was torn down in 1957. Grafton Common remains a symbolic center of Grafton. Originally used as a common grazing area for local livestock, it has evolved into a site for community events. In 1935, a Hollywood movie, Ah, a Wilderness, was filmed in Grafton Center. It was a source of great excitement since famous movie stars, including Cecilia Parker, Eric Linden, and Mickey Rooney came to town. Many local folks were hired as extras for $3 per day. When I was in the seventh grade, we had a movie made in this town. And I was fortunate enough, they picked 10 of us young kids to be in the movies, and I was lucky enough to get picked. We were the heroes for the summer because we went up there, and I used to make $21 a week. If you come in each one, you put your knickers on and your long stockings and your, your clogged shoes. And I was the biggest disappointment in my life was Cecilia Parker. She was the most beautiful thing in the world when she came out of the makeup room. I was in love with her. They had a little party with all of us, and so she went in and took all her makeup off, and it was night and day. And that was a dissolution. A bandstand was built on the common for one of the movie scenes, and a local Grafton band played on that bandstand in the movie. At the close of the filming, the bandstand was given to the town as a gift and has been maintained on the common ever since. 
Grafton was a farming community from its beginnings and remained so for almost 250 years until the 1960s. Most of the original investors were farmers. The people of Grafton subsist mainly by the cultivation of the soil, and they are amply compensated for all their labor. They have one or two traders in foreign goods, and the usual tradesmen and mechanics. There is no pond in the town, but upon the several rivers and streams there are four grist mills, several saw mills, three trip hammers, and one fulling mill. There were nearly 900 inhabitants when the census was taken about two years ago. Peter Whitney, 1792. The new settlement, situated on the frontier, far from coastal communities, needed to become self-sufficient. Transporting goods from the coast was costly and slow. From the earliest days, sawmills and blacksmith shops were needed to produce lumber and equipment for farming and household use. Grist mills were needed to grind their corn. To provide power for these mills, the settlers relied on water power from the nearby rivers and streams. The first dam to be built by the founders was on the Quinsigaman River at the base of what is now Brigham Hill Road. Damming of the river resulted in the formation of a new pond now called Lake Ripple. During the late 1700s, small shops and homes were built near the dam, creating the small settlement of Centerville. For 100 years, this dam site served the community. In 1846, Leander Pratt bought the old mill and replaced it with a new brick building establishing the Pratt Cotton Mill. By 1879, this mill was producing 80,000 yards of cotton sheeting each month. Unfortunately, the mill burned in 1895 and little evidence remains of either the mill or the small settlement that had existed around it. In the early 1800s, Misco Brook near the Upton border was dammed to provide power to run a machine shop for the manufacture of shoe tools or kits for the growing Grafton shoe industry. Another business operating in the area manufactured razors around 1840. A cluster of houses was built nearby. One of the principals in the machine shop was Levi Leland, who also invented and patented a leather splitting machine in 1837. Leland also presented himself as a furniture maker. The Grafton Historical Society Museum has two pieces of furniture which bear his label a chest of drawers, and a small table. His label, found inside the drawer, reads, Levi N. Leland informs his friends and the public in general that he will furnish them with all kinds of cabinet furniture of the neatest workmanship and newest styles at fair prices. The machine shop burned twice in both 1855 and 1861. Legend has it that before the mill was built, the local natives objected to it because one of their burial grounds would be disturbed. When their objection was ignored, the matriarch of the tribe put a curse on the mill. Later, the mill mysteriously burned to the ground. It was rebuilt, but again it was destroyed by fire. After 1861, the mill was not rebuilt and the site was abandoned. Today, all that remains is the dam and the raceway. As early as 1760, high-quality scythes were being made at a dam on the Quinsigamond River in what is now called North Grafton. In the late 1700s, this was also the site of a shoddy mill, a mill processing rags into recycled cloth. In 1825, another dam was built farther upstream on the river by William Hovey to supply the Blackstone Canal with water. The following year, all water rights in the area were sold to one company, the New England Manufacturing Company, makers of twines and bags from linen and jute. The village that grew up along this section of the river was called New England Village after the linen mill. The village continued to grow as the company expanded with a new stone factory, intendments for workers, and two churches. 
Many small businesses were attracted to the area. In 1880, a Scottish firm, Finlayson, Boosfield and Company, purchased the mill to manufacture linen thread used in the making of shoes, saddles and book bindings. Additional tenements were constructed for the Scottish and Canadian immigrants who came there to work. My mother came down from Nova Scotia through the um, advertisement from the, it was the thread mill. They paid for her way down and they had a place for them to live. They called them the blocks, but they're actually tenements. And um, they would take the money out of the salary until it was paid. My dad, his parents came down from Quebec, Canada. The mill also purchased the surrounding farmland for a large dairy farm to help feed the growing population. What we now call Blackberry Hill Farm was Quinn Sigamon Farm uh, right on uh, Hovey Pond. It was the farm for the linen thread mill. In 1880, my grandfather, he was the boss farmer for the mill dairy farm. The horses did all the trucking from the mill to the old depot. When the mill went out of business as a farm, my grandfather literally bought the farm. Back in the days when there were horse-drawn fire wagons, mm -hmm. they would take the horses from the fields right to the station. And I remember Years later, one of those horses was still living at our farm, hadn't died yet. He'd been retired for many years, and I was riding him. And the fire siren went off, and didn't that horse run right to the station? I couldn't stop him. In 1868, Washington Mills Emery Manufacturing Company set up shop nearby on the site of an old grist mill. They produced natural emery abrasive grain from ore imported from Turkey. The growing village attracted merchants who set up shop along Main Street. Other small manufacturers were attracted to the area. In 1832, Ethan Allen, an inventor and manufacturer of firearms, came to North Grafton to set up a business on Waterville Street to make cutlery. He built a dam to supply water power to run his machines. He is most famous for his pepper box pistol, a self-cocking revolver. It was the only multi-shot firearm available to civilians at that time. The business eventually became Allen and Thurber. The Grafton Historical Society Museum displays an Ethan Allen pocket rifle, a small handgun with a rifled barrel for improved accuracy. At about the same time, Edwin Wesson, the eldest of three brothers, established a firearms business on Wesson Street. He was a superb craftsman and taught his two brothers his skill. Edwin died of a heart attack at age 37, but his brothers continued the business with great success. After moving to Hartford and Springfield, the company eventually became Smith & Wesson. In 